And good morning. Do we have anybody else celebrating St. Patrick's Day today? Anybody? Anybody at all? Everything looks green to me. Yeah. It's St. Patrick's Day. And uh, uh, forgive me for being a little bit foolish, but 29 years ago today, uh, a little baby was placed in my arms, and uh, I learned to celebrate St. Patrick's Day uh, all fresh and anew. Our little girl, Rebecca, was born on St. Patrick's Day. You may not know as well, our second child, Ro- uh, Robert, was also born on 4th of July. So Becca got a parade, and Robert got fireworks. Uh, they grew up, we just told him, hey, this is all for you. Everybody's celebrating. And then Ryan came along, born on the 10th of July. We're convinced he'll be in therapy someday. <laughs> All he got was a cake, you know, and he's like, man, what's wrong with this picture? But because uh, of Rebecca being born on St. Patrick's Day, I all of a sudden kind of became a, a, a student of wanting to study what, what is St. Patrick's Day all about? And, and uh, what I came to discover is there's a neat story, it actually was a real St. Patrick, and um, his story is very neat. What's unfortunate, as is often is the case, our celebration uh, of this day in honor of him <laughs> really almost has nothing to do with his life. It's really kind of sad the way we choose to celebrate his day. Uh, we don't know when he was born. March 17th was the day of his death. And, uh, but I would continue in his story that even though March 17th is acknowledged as his death, uh, what St. Patrick teaches us in his story is he, he really died to self long before he physically died. And that's what makes his story uh, so interesting and so captivating. Um, what we know of him is that when he was 16 years old, uh, he was uh, taken captive uh, in Britain, and he was taken to Ireland where he was a slave. Uh, for six years, he was a slave in Ireland, and uh, during that period of time, uh, he basically was a shepherd, if you will. He, he worked with animals. He was enslaved there. And, uh, and he would tell in his own writing about how significant that period of time was in terms of him drawing near to God, him finding God, learning to rely upon God and lean on God to help him as he went through this, uh, this terrible time of, of being enslaved. And eventually he would escape. After six years being enslaved there, he escapes. He gets back home. And, uh, and his, as his story unfolds, he has a vision of God calling him to go back to the people of Ireland, the very people who enslaved him, and to take the gospel, the love of Jesus Christ, back to Ireland. And so that's, in essence, his story, why he's worthy of being celebrated. And uh, you can just see all the things we've added to that along the way that uh, kind of are nothing more than a distraction, really, in terms of who he was and what his life was about. And so I share that story with you because the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today Uh, I think uh, is quite appropriate for St. Patrick's story. And so my prayer is that God can speak to each of us as as we study his word together. Let's look at James chapter 4. We continue in our study of the book of James. And the message this morning entitled, Overcoming Division, Demons, and the Devil. Anybody deal with any of those? Uh, My guess is that we all do in one way or another. So let's begin. James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. He asked the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? What can we know about the people James is writing to? There must be some fighting going on, right? I mean, you don't start a passage that way unless there's some kind of fighting and quarreling going on. So it may be a bit of a stretch for us in the American church to be able to find application for this since we have so moved away from quarreling and fighting. Uh, That was a joke, by the way. So uh, the reality is that we too can relate to what James is talking about in this, this issue of, of how often, even though God created us to be in relationship, we struggle to be in relationship. So if we're going to find application for this passage, really the question maybe is this. Do you have any issues right now in your life, relationally speaking, with family members, coworkers, neighbors, people in the community you've had some kind of run-in with, and all of a sudden, the reality is, yes, we, we know what it is to have quarrels and fights. James says, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Now, the teaching here is he's already moving us in, a, in, in the direction we need to go because most of us would say, yes, pastor, we have quarrels and fights, and who's the problem? Whose fault is it? 
It's always the other person, right? I mean, generally speaking, human nature says, my problem that I have with somebody, it's all them. And, and, and God, do something with them. But James is taking us a different direction. He says, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? In other words, isn't the struggle really within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. So the first thing he's saying is you have these, the reality is we have these quarrels, we have these issues and these fights. He says you don't ask God. You're not bringing God into the picture, into the equation. And then he says, it's almost as if he can anticipate the question that someone's saying, oh, yes, but we did pray about it. We did ask God. And he says, yeah, I know. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. In other words, he said, when you do pray, it's only to bring kind of triangle God in on your side. They basically say, God, see, it's their fault instead of just truly praying for God to speak into the situation. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the Spirit God caused to dwell in us longs jealously? But God gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and God will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. When I think about quarrels and fights, I remember as a little boy growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, and one of the first quarrels I remember was over a baseball. You see, we, uh, I had two older brothers, and and we lived in this subdivision there in Louisville, and our backyard did not have a fence, and our neighbor's backyard did not have a fence, but the third neighbor down, they had a fence around their yard, and so we made a baseball field. That fence of theirs was the home run fence, and then you, in our backyard, you could see the baseline worn into the grass, and we would play baseball, and uh, the problem was I was the youngest. Most of the, my brothers were older. Most of the the uh, neighbors were their age, at least it seemed like to me. And so they would all get together and play baseball. And I was always this one, you know, I, I know what it is to be the last one picked. Actually, not just the last one picked. It would go something like this. Uh, okay, you guys take Bobby. No, no, you guys can have Bobby. No, no, you take Bobby. And, and I would finally just kind of wander off like, really? And so this particular day that I remember, my parents had bought me a glove, a new glove, and a baseball. And I had it in my room, and sure enough, there was a woods on the other side of the, uh, the backyards. There was no houses back there. It just was a, a wooded area. And we lost so many baseballs. We'd foul them off, and they'd end up out there in the woods. And we'd seen snakes out there once, or at least the stories were told there were snakes, and we weren't going in there looking for those baseballs, right? So, so on this particular day, they lost the only baseball they had. And when I saw it happen, and I realized they didn't have a baseball, the light came on my head, and I thought, I got a baseball, and I ran into my room, and I got my baseball and my glove, and I remember standing over there just pitching it in the air. Na, 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 na. And, and they're looking over there. They see I've got a baseball, but I'm trying to use it for leverage. Like, okay, you want the baseball? Then I have to play, right? I mean, that's how it worked, at least so I thought. What I didn't factor in was that they were bigger than me. And so basically, as brothers often do, they just beat me up and took the baseball. So... <laughs> What causes fights and quarrels among you? You desire something. They wanted something. They took it. And, uh, and often we can imagine this kind of passage, like whether it's uh, with children uh, in a room and, and there's one toy introduced or the most popular toy and all the kids want that toy and, and everybody goes fighting over it. And that's really the picture that James is painting here. And it's just human nature that when we want something and, and the desires are within us and we, we begin to try to fight and quarrel to get what we want. And into that reality, James begins to speak. 
And he begins to give us some wisdom, I believe, of how we can overcome division, demons that we all deal with within ourselves and the devil. In fact, one of the things that's very clear in this passage is the reality that there is an enemy, the devil. The Bible speaks very clearly. And my, my prayer is that we can gather and, and begin at that point of understanding there is an enemy. How many of you know the devil never takes vacation? All right? In my life, he's relentless. And he's always there. It seems like every day. And what I'm learning with each passing day and each passing year as I try to learn to look to God is all the ways. I even now see he sets traps for me. Does anybody else have that happen? Like he literally sets traps. And sometimes I step right in it. And, and, and he's trying to somehow pull me away from God destroy the character and the image of God within me. Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And every one of us, in one way or another, deal with this enemy. I've learned to kind of begin to see the enemy in 3D, right? If you have our 3D glasses, and basically he distracts, he wants to get your attention, and sometimes just pull us away into some little issue. It's not even a big deal at all, but he can, he can make it a big deal, right? He distracts, and then he divides. He so wants to divide us to destroy us. So it's distract, divide, destroy. And here's God working to bring us together, to unite us as one. Certainly, as James writes, he's dealing with this reality. And he's trying to teach them in the early church how to overcome the divisions that the enemy's trying to bring about. Divisions between Jew and Gentile. Certainly division between those who were part of the church in Jerusalem who are now scattered abroad. And how God has put them there on mission to reach those they're in contact with. So what does it look like to overcome devil, demons, and division? Well, I believe James gives us a prescription here, a recipe, if you will, of the things we need to do, the steps we need to take. And I want to focus on that now as we think about what it means to overcome division, demons, and the devil. The first step, when James, after he lays the picture out, The first thing he says we need to do is submit yourselves then to God. It all starts, the first step is submitting to God. Now, what does it mean to submit to God? Let's just be honest. uh, That's that's not uh, something we really like to do. In fact, uh, uh, I'm going to take my uh, shamrock off here. My my mom used to tell me when I was little that I would try to uh, iron these shamrocks. Um, well, sort of. She, she said I tried to press my luck. So pretty much, <laughs> pretty much the same thing. So rather than do that, what does it mean to submit to God? And the first thing I think we have to all acknowledge is we don't like submitting. The Bible says we need to submit to one another, and we don't like that either. And it all starts with understanding what it means to submit to God. Submitting to God is an act of loving and trusting God so much that you're willing to choose to follow God and whatever authority he places over your life. Now, I want you to think about that, biblical teaching about authority and how often we want to throw off the authority that God's placed in our life because we either don't like what's happening or we don't like the direction. And so ultimately what we end up doing is saying, I'm not going to submit to God. Now, it's interesting that we would focus on this passage of Scripture on St. Patrick's Day. Because as I shared his story a little bit earlier, St. Patrick really is a perfect example of what it means to submit to God. We have to believe that once he was taken captive and enslaved for six years, if we allow him to be human at all, when he had a vision of taking the very love of God that he experienced there in Ireland when God came to him and he came to understand God better. And now God's saying, I want you to go back and I want you to share my heart, my love, my grace with the very people who held you captive. How many of you, if we allow Patrick to be human, would say, no, no, I'm not, not gonna do that. And so the only way that he gets back there And the fact that we celebrate his life today and acknowledge him is because he submitted to God. So what does that look like? How do you submit to God? 
Well, I'm going to suggest to you, often, as often is the case, if we want to truly learn what it looks like, we need to look to Jesus. Because God is in the process of making us more like Jesus. So let's find a time when Jesus gives us an example and teaches us what it looks like to submit to God. And I would suggest to you, if you're familiar with the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus models for us what it looks like to submit to God. So I want you to, if we're going to really apply this, and James wants to be so practical in his teaching, I want you to think now about a situation where you have an issue, a quarrel with someone, be in your family, your neighbor, co-worker, the enemy. I, I can almost assure you this. All of us, to one degree or another, have this issue. And the reason I know that we do is because there's this enemy Jesus told us about. And he's going to come at all of us in some way or another. And he's trying to create that division and that destruction. And so when we look at it, we say, okay, God, in this situation, I want to submit to you. And we may be able to relate in some way even to St. Patrick and say, I know what it is to be treated unfairly. I know what it is to end up in a place I never planned to be, didn't want to be. It was the actions of someone else and their behavior that took me to this place. And that's why I'm here. And you may have all kinds of feelings of injustice. It's not fair. And all of a sudden, James says, in the midst of your quarrels, submit to God. So we look to Jesus. What's the first thing he did? He prayed. So I would suggest to you, submitting to God is about praying. So you take the issue and you begin to pray about it. You bring God into the equation. You say, God, I want to submit to you in this circumstance, in this issue. Now, James said, sometimes you, you have not, you don't have the wisdom you need, you don't have the guidance you need because you don't ask for it, but other times you ask for it, but you ask for it with wrong motives. I mean, you're not really even asking God. You're basically praying and telling God what God needs to do. How many of you know how to pray like that? Like, God, here's what you need to do. You need to, you need to make them pay, right? Go get them. He's saying, I'm just going to pray. And the second thing Jesus teaches us, if we look in the garden, we hear him sharing how he feels. Can anybody not read that experience of Jesus in the garden and, under, and not come away with the understanding that he does not want to go to the cross? He says things like, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do it. And I want to suggest to you that's an important part of the prayer. Because if you don't acknowledge the struggle of how you feel, it's real easy to slip into just pretending and playing a game. And you say the right things where deep down your, the struggle stays within. James is saying, isn't this problem the struggles that are within you? Let that struggle come out and pray it to God. Let God know how you feel. It doesn't, it's not that he doesn't already know how you feel. It's just we need to give voice to it. And we need to say, God, I don't like this. It's okay. Because the third thing Jesus does is what is most important when it teaches us about submitting. What did, what did he say? But not what? Not my will, but your will be done. That's the part of the prayer where Jesus submits. He prays, he tells God the Father how he feels about it, but he says, God, at the end, I want to do what you want. Now, what does that look like in our lives? All right, let's get real practical. We got an issue, we got a quarrel, we got a problem. We feel the struggle and we pray about it. We say, God, I need your help. And here's how I feel about it, God. I don't think it's fair, I don't like it. Much the way Patrick may have said, I don't like the way they took me captive. I don't think it's fair. They, took, they robbed me of these years. But at the end of it, if Patrick's gonna end up in Ireland as a missionary, he had to, in some way or another, say, but God, not my will, but what do you want, God? And God said, well, I'll tell you what, Patrick, what I'd like to do, <laughs> I'd like to take that time in your life that was terrible and redeem it and bring good out of it. So I'd like for you to go back to Ireland and you share the love of Christ. You share the love that I've placed in your heart. And he went. And I think what James is saying is the reason we don't want to necessarily pray that prayer is because we're, we're almost aware that 
If you've been around church any time at all, you kind of know what God's will is, don't you, in some of these relational issues? You're going to tell God how you feel about it, how unfair it was, how it's not right, and God's going to say, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go forgive them. I want you to go extend grace to them. I want you to show love to them. I want you to be kind to them. And you're going to say, mm, not what I wanted to hear, right? Can anybody at all know what I'm talking about? It's in that moment that we understand what it is to become more like Christ. We die to self. And James is saying, if you learn to die to self, you'll discover that God is working to solve the problem. Because the first thing we must learn is the problem is not always the other person. Sometimes the problem is what's going on in here. And it's not until I submit to God that he can begin to address what's in here that needs to be addressed. The second step that James teaches is not only submitting to God, but standing up to the schemes of the devil. Standing up to the schemes of the devil. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now again, here's a very important passage of Scripture letting us know there is the reality of a devil. How many of you are aware of the fact that there's a devil? There is this enemy who's going to come against you. And don't kid yourself into believing that, that he looked at you sometime back, I don't know, maybe like back in November of 2012, and he said, you know what? I'm just going to leave that guy alone. He's got it so together. I'm just going to leave him alone. Hear me. He doesn't say that to any of us. No, no, no. He's relentless. He knows your weakness. He knows how to keep coming at you. And Scripture teaches we must resist the devil. Now, the promise is, is if we will resist him, he will flee. We can put him on the run. How many of you have the devil running from you? Often because we're not resisting him. Now, let me help you out a little bit. I want to get as practical as I can. How do you know when the devil has shown up and when you need to resist him? It usually goes something like this. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. It's not going to hurt anybody. And it's in those moments when he begins to whisper into your ear, it's not a big deal. Everybody's doing it. Nobody's going to know. How many of you know the Bible teaches that your sin will be found out? <laughs> the Bible teaches that. Which is interesting how the devil always tries to say, no, 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 no that's, a, that's a lie. No, no. Trust me, he says. Nobody's going to know. And it's what you choose to do when he starts whispering in your ear that has everything to do with whether or not we resist so that he has to flee. You say, well, how do I resist then, Pastor? Well, Peter gives us some insight. He says, be alert and sober-minded. How many of you know uh, if you get drunk, you, you're more vulnerable to the enemy, right? I mean, how many lives get destroyed because somebody's like, I didn't even know what I was doing? The enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You got to get that picture. He's prowling, on the prowl, constantly looking for somebody. Resist him. Okay, so there it is again. But Peter gives us a little more insight. Resist him standing firm in the faith. So there you might want to circle that. So you resist him by standing firm in the faith. In other words, you have to believe in that moment that God is with you and you stand in your faith and you believe. And the first thing we need to recognize, if we're going to stand firm in the faith, it means we're standing in God's strength, not our own. Here's the key. You cannot ever resist the devil in your own strength. If you try it in your own strength, here's what it's going to look like. You're going to sin and you're going to say, ah, I feel bad about that. I'm never going to do that again. Never going to do that again. That's the last time. I am never going to do that again. And what happens? You do it again, of course. And, and because you're trying to do it in your own strength, you say, ah, oh, Man, I did it again. I'm never going to do that again. That's the last time. I am never going to do that again. And what happens? You do it again. And all that's showing you is you, you're trying to resist the devil in your own strength. 
It's like somebody who loves brownies, staring at a brownie, and then tearing off a little corner of it, saying, I'm only going to eat that corner. And somebody else watching is saying, who are you kidding yourself? I'm just going to watch. How long is it going to take you to eat that brownie one little corner at a time? Because you're going to keep trying to resist. Oh, I'm not going to do it. But then you just keep going back until it's all gone. And you bake another pan of brownies. (laughs) You cannot resist the devil in your own strength. If you're going to stand firm in the faith, it means in that moment you start praying and you start asking, God, help me. I need your help, God. And when you start praying for help, it takes us to Ephesians 6. Paul also spoke about this same issue. So you got James, Peter, and Paul all addressing this issue. Paul says to the Ephesian church in chapter 6, finally, be strong in the Lord. Again, who's the strength? Where's the strength come from? It comes from the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the What? Let me tell you on a secret. If you're going to stand firm in the faith and you're going to let God help you, the very first thing you've got to understand that Scripture is very clear on, but we get confused easily. If you think your struggle, your battle, is against that other person, you've already been deceived. That's how deceitful the enemy is. Scripture would say to you, if you think the other person is who you have the problem with, you've already missed the bigger picture of what's happening. Our struggles, our battles are not against flesh and blood. Let me see if I can illustrate. Jesus pulled his disciples aside one day. He said, who do people say that I am? They said, well, some say one of the prophets. He said, what about you? Who do you say I am? It was Peter. If you know that story, Peter said, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. And, and, and Jesus said to Peter, Simon Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. You just, you just heard from heaven. God revealed something to you. Peter must have felt pretty good about that, right? In front of all the disciples, he's like, yeah, yeah. You guys hear that? (laughs) I just heard from heaven. But according to Scripture, it was only a short time later that Jesus began to say to them, now that you understand who I am, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be crucified. And Peter must have jumped up and said, whoa, 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 time out, time out, Jesus. No, 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 no. That can't happen. For in that moment, Peter was confronted with the reality that he had merely been a smelly fisherman at one point in his life. And all of a sudden, he was becoming somebody important. He was traveling with a popular rabbi, and he was one of the top disciples in that group. And he must have felt like, I'm somebody now. Jesus, that can't happen. No way. To which Jesus said what? Get behind me, Satan. Was Jesus saying Peter was Satan? No, no. He was simply saying, Peter, in this moment, Satan's got a hold of you. And wisdom in God's word would teach us, you've got to understand our struggles are not against other people. If they're against other people, you'll find yourself pulled into places where you start slandering and attacking other people because you think it's the other person. And the enemy is wrecking havoc and destruction in your life and you're deceived. You don't even see what's really happening. Now, am I suggesting that you go to that coworker you're having trouble with and say, tomorrow morning, get behind me, Satan? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Don't, 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 don't. But I am saying in your heart, you need to have the wisdom to walk into that situation. Just as St. Patrick must have had when he went back to Ireland. And he looked at those people that God wanted him to share the love of Christ with, and he said, Get behind me, Satan. I'm not going to let you stand in the way of what God wants to do. Because when we submit to God and we stand up against the schemes of the devil, we begin to open up the way for God to work to bring healing and hope into a situation. And can I let you in on a secret?
God wants to do that in and through us. That's what James is teaching. If you want hope and healing into the situations where there's quarrels and fighting and struggling, understand this. God wants to start with you. He says, I want entry into that situation. I want you to open up your heart and allow me to come in and I'll do a work. But sometimes the way we handle these situations, what we really end up saying is, God, I just want to let it continue. I want to keep stirring it up. I I just want it to go on and on and on. We're never going to really resolve this issue. We just want to keep fighting and slandering and we're going to try to play it out in the public uh, arena and see who wins in the public arena. That's not what God intends. God says he wants to bring healing. He wants to bring unity. He wants to bring us together. And it all has to do with submitting to God and standing up to the devil, realizing the devil is going to keep trying to stir things up. We resist him. And that leads us to the final point. It's about stepping toward God. Stepping. What's the next step going to be? James put it this way, come near to God and he will come near to you. There's a step involved in that. If you're going to come near to God, you take that first step. And the promise is when we take that step of faith, God comes near to us. Probably the best picture we have of that is the most popular parable in Scripture, the parable of the prodigal son, right? He's in a pig pen. At some point, we're told he came to his senses. He all of a sudden realized, what am I doing here? Far, far from the Father. I don't know if there's a mirror close by that day. Can you imagine if he glanced up and just saw pig slop on his face? And he knew full well he was better than that. How did I get here? I don't know if there's a mirror there that day for him, but I do know that I know what it's like to glance in a mirror in my own life. And see stuff on my face and say, how did I get here? A grimace, a growl, upset and angry. How did I get here? And what's the next step going to be? And we celebrate in that parable that the prodigal son got up out of that pig pen. He started back toward the father. And what's beautiful, I think what we all love about that story is as he takes those steps toward God, the Father comes running to him with an embrace. James is painting that picture. Come near to God, he'll come near to you. He says, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts. Sometimes we don't understand that completely. In Jewish culture, they would have understood, having recently traveled in Israel, I can tell you that, that it's a big deal how you, how you wash your hands even before you enter into the synagogue and, and all the thorough washing that they do. And, and, and basically what he's saying is it's a way of saying, uh, I want to be cleansed, I want to be made right, I want to wash away the sin I've been a part of. It's a step toward God that involves repenting of sin. Now notice, He started this passage by saying, what causes quarrels and fights among you? And now he leads them to a place of saying, you need to pray and repent. I remind you again what James is teaching. He's saying, if you want to find resolution to the problems, let it start in you. Who are you, he said, to judge your brother or sister? You need to first come and confess your part, your sin. You need to begin to repent of my part And that step of repentance leads to the next step. And that's renewing my mind and my heart. Notice James introduces a word for us here. He says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. You might want to circle that double-minded. It's the second time that James has mentioned that word. And it might interest you to know that word is found nowhere else in Scripture. Some theologians believe that James coined that phrase, double-minded. What's he talking about? What's it mean to be double-minded? Well, I want to see if I can illustrate. Uh, I brought a fan with me today. Sometimes when I get down, I just want a fan. No. Yeah, there we go. And I want you to observe this fan. You know, it's springtime. My guess is you might start using a fan sometime soon. And 
And uh, just want you to look at this fan because it can illustrate for us what it means to be double-minded, right? Um, what's it doing? It's called oscillating. If I'd have got that word to spelling bee, I would not have won. But I know what oscillating means, and it means to go back and forth. If you want to know what it means to be double-minded, we have a fan here trying to teach us what it looks like. It means, let's say, I'm a person of faith. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And then Monday morning arrives, and I do what I've always done. And then God gets my attention. I say, you know what? I'm, God, forgive me. And I go and do it again. And I knew I was going to do it again when I asked for forgiveness. But because God's gracious, I asked him to forgive me again because I know I'm going to go sin again. And I say, oh, God, I'm in the midst of a terrible situation, and I pray, and I, but I really doubt that God's going to do anything. Uh, James said... That kind of person is like somebody just caught up in a storm. They, they should really expect nothing from God because they're all over the place. And all I can tell you is I know what it is to struggle with being double-minded, facing an issue that I, I believe God can do something and I pray God's going to do something. I'm just convinced. And I say, but by the time I get to my car... I'm already back to where I was. And then I go to church and I say, God, okay, I'm, this time I'm committing to you, God. I am with you, God. I'm going to do it your way, God. Until I pull out of the parking lot. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And I think what James is saying to us is if you want God to come into your life at some point, you stop oscillating. And you say, God, I'm going to submit to you. I don't understand how you're going to work it out, God, but I trust you and I love you and I believe you're with me. I'm going this way. And when the tough times come and the enemy comes against you and the enemy starts getting into your head, like, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? You say, I'm going to resist you, but not in my strength. I'm going to begin to pray, God, give me the strength to stand firm. And I'm going to take that step toward God. What's it look like to take a step toward God? Maybe it's just opening his word, saying, God, speak to me. I need you, God. Maybe it's taking a step toward people that God's placed in your life, your church family, saying, God, come around me. The enemy's working on me. I need, I need your strength, God. And you begin to pray. And as you take that step, submitting to God, God begins to unfold his plan. And like St. Patrick, we can see God do some wonderful, incredible things. I'm guessing he could not have imagined all that God would do in his life when he submitted to God and stepped back into Ireland. And all I'm trying to say to you is whatever the situation, whatever the issue might be for you today, May we hear God speaking to us today that if we really want to find the solution, if we really want to see God work it out in his strength, with his wisdom, we submit to God. We resist the devil, knowing he's going to come against us in God's strength, and we step toward God. If you've never been baptized, that may be a step God's leading you to take. Just Submit, trust him, take that step. If you never made a profession of faith to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that's a step of faith toward God. Or maybe you like that prodigal. Just find yourself today in a place you never wanted to be, you never planned to be, never thought you'd be. But all you gotta do is come to your senses, let God speak to you, hear from God. Take that next step toward God, and I pray you will feel his embrace, his love, his grace, his mercy. In Psalms 51, David gives us a powerful picture of what it looks like to step toward God. After his sin with Bathsheba, he said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. 
the joy of what it means to be saved, to be your child, and create in me a new heart, a pure heart. Change my heart, God. I think all these people are basically saying to us the same thing. If there are issues, if there are quarrels, don't judge your brother or sister. Submit to God. And allow God to begin the work of hope and healing in our hearts.